Doncs molt, molt bon vespre. A veure si, si em donen veu. Bé, encara no. Bon vespre. Encès el micro. El teu funciona? Ah, molt bon vespre. Perfecte. Bueno, bon vespre, benvingudes, benvinguts a aquesta sessió de la Biennal de Ciència de Barcelona en la qual parlarem de biologia sintètica i enginyeria per generar sistemes vius. Eh, faré una introducció en català i ho presentaré als ponents en català eh, i després farem tot el debat i les presentacions en anglès, però tindreu la possibilitat de seguir-lo amb eh, subtitulat. Eh, bé, eh, la meva introducció serà molt breu. Bàsicament, eh, aquest títol pot fer pensar en quelcom que sigui molt exòtic o molt futurista, etc. Jo només volia donar-vos quatre pinzelades de coses que no són ben bé el que parlarem en aquest debat, que però us poden donar una idea de com aquesta idea d'enginyeritzar sistemes vius eh, realment ja és quelcom que està viu amb nosaltres. Okay? Potser l'exemple per mi més, eh, més destacat és sense dubte el cas de l'insulina. No? L'insulina des dels anys 80 la que s'utilitza per les persones que tenen, un, que tenen eh, eh, diabetes, està generada per part d'unes bactèries, és a dir, ja no es punxa per treure l'insulina a un animal, sinó es genera per part d'unes bactèries modificades expressament per aquesta funció. Això passa amb altres substàncies, per exemple, l'artemicina que s'utilitza en la malària. Potser un altre àmbit en el qual segurament haureu sentit un altre exemple que podríem esmentar seria el cas del CRISPR, aquesta tecnologia que permet diguem-ne tallar i enganxar ADN d'una forma totalment eh, molt més precisa i molt més barata i molt més ràpida de totes les tecnologies anteriors i potser una curiositat és que l'origen, l'idea inicial, diguem el descobriment del mecanisme de tot això va ser en unes bactèries d'unes salines d'aquí de València per part d'un investigador d'aquí i després altres van agafar aquella idea i les van transformar en una tecnologia o Igual, no sé, l'exemple més proper d'aquesta idea d'enginyeritzar material viu per obtenir coses útils que estem vivint en primera persona són les, aquestes noves vacunes de RNA missatger que eh, han fet el seu exploar, diguem-ne, en ocasió d'aquesta, d'aquesta pandèmia. Bueno, com avui parlarem d'altres coses, parlem de coses més de fronteres, etc., però crec que era interess- em semblava interessant eh, desmitificar una mica aquesta paraula de la biologia sintètica i anar... A, um, a, a veure com és, és una cosa que realment ja forma part de les nostres vides. Per parlar d'aquest tema, comptem amb tres ponents realment eh, de referència, diguem que realment ens poden aportar molt sobre aquest tema. En primer lloc, presencialment, la Núria Montserrat, que és professora de recerca i crea a l'Institut de Bioenginyeria de, de Catalunya, i remotament, ara els veureu aviat en aquesta pantalla, el Michael Levin, que és eh, bioinformàtic de la Universitat Taft de Massachusetts, als Estats Units, i Ron Weiss, eh, que és eh, investigador de l'Institut eh, Tecnològic de Massachusetts, el famosíssim MIT, i que es considera, de fet, un dels pares dels pioners de la, de la biologia sintètica. Aquí s'acaba la meva introducció. Eh, ara donarem un torn de paraula als eh, ponents, començant pel, pel Michael Levin, eh, passaré, bueno, faré la presentació en català i després passarem a l'anglès. Eh, eh, com us deia, Michael Levin és professor distingit a la eh, Universitat Tufts de Massachusetts. Eh, és de formació informàtic, però també va fer un doctorat en genètica a Medicina a Harvard i eh, tota la seva investigació ha anat una mica en la intersecció, diguem-ne, d'aquests àmbits, no? que aparentment pareixen, semblen tan allunyats com són la, la informàtica, la ciència cognitiva i tot allò que té que veure, que, que, té que veure, que veure en la vida. So, uh, uh, good afternoon, good morning for you, Michael Levin, thanks for, for being with us, and so the, the floor is yours for your presentation, you have around 10 minutes, and then we will move to the other speakers, and, uh, and then to the debate and there will be also plenty of, uh, of uh, time for you to uh, ask, your, uh, ask your questions to the speakers. 
Well, thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, and I would like to speak to you today about the collective intelligence of cells as a new roadmap for regenerative medicine. And uh, you can see right away that uh, cells are extremely competent. So this is the unicellular organism. There is no brain, there is no nervous system. All of its needs, the physiological, the anatomical, and the behavioral needs are all handled at the level of one cell. There is no nervous system, there's no cell-to-cell -cell communication, there are no stem cells. Everything is done in this one cell. So single cells are in fact very competent, but the most amazing thing they do is that they work together in groups to achieve very specific goals. So here are some embryonic cells and they work together to build, this here is a cross section through a human body. And you can see the amazing, uh, all of the organization of the different tissues and organs that have to be placed exactly in the right uh, orientation, the right size, the right positioning, everything has to be exactly correct. And so it's very important to figure out where this pattern is stored because the DNA codes for proteins. So the genome gives you proteins, but what the cells really have to do is build a very complex structure. We have to understand where the structure is specified. And then we have some animals such as these, these are called planaria. These are planarian flatworms and planaria can be cut into many pieces. The record is something like 275 and every, little piece will regenerate exactly what it's missing. So no more, no less makes exactly what's needed to make a perfect tiny little worm. And so they regenerate their brain, every organ in the body they can regenerate. In fact, planaria are basically immortal. They have no lifespan limit because they continuously regenerate anything that's missing. And even uh, more advanced creatures like salamanders can regenerate their limbs. And so this is what it looks like when you amputate a limb. Um, they will regenerate a perfect copy and then they stop. And so salamanders can regenerate their eyes, their limbs, their jaws, their portions of the brain, um, ovary, spinal cord, incredibly regenerative. So we really have to understand not only how cells build these structures, but how they can repair them and rebuild them after damage. And one of the most interesting things about it is that this process is intelligent, meaning it's flexible and it can make up for novel circumstances. So one example here is a tadpole. So this is a very early um, frog embryo. You can see the eyes here, the nostrils, and this is the brain. So all of these organs have to move around for a tadpole to become a frog. Okay, so the jaws have to move forward, the eyes have to move, the nostrils have to move. But the amazing thing is that what this uh, creature does is not simply move every piece of the face the, in some direction, the, the right amount of, uh, of distance, but if you make what we call Picasso-like tadpoles, basically these are tadpoles where all the organs start out in the wrong position. So the eyes might be on the back of the head, the jaws are off to the one side, everything is in the wrong position, but they still make pretty normal frogs. So all of these components can move around in novel paths that are not the same as they would normally do in order to achieve a correct frog face. So what the genetics gives you is not a, a machine that uh, executes specific movements every single time, but actually a kind of error minimization scheme. Okay, it's a, it's a system that can um, handle novelty like wrong starting positions and still get to the right position at the end. And this is incredibly important. These responses in that way are flexible. They're not just hardwired. Now, how does this work? Well, remarkably, part of the story is what we call developmental bioelectricity. So it turns out that not only neurons, so this is a familiar story in neurons, that neural cells can make uh, electrical potentials because of these little ion channel proteins, and those potentials propagate to their neighbors, and there's a whole electrical network that can execute intelligence, behavior, and so on. It turns out that all cells do this, okay? And we've, just, we've created some of the first molecular tools to begin to track the electrical conversations that all of the cells in your body are having with each other. And here you can see, this is a movie made of a early frog embryo, and the different colors are uh, the signal from a voltage sensitive fluorescent dye. So this is not a model or a simulation, this is a real embryo in time lapse. And you can see all of the electrical conversations that these cells are having with each other to figure out who's going to be head, tail, left and right, and so on. And so uh, it's very likely that uh, complex brains evolved by optimizing for speed, a very ancient, a very evolutionarily ancient system that uh, was first used by cell collectives to decide what shape they're going to build. Okay, this is the information flow that is used for cells to figure out what they're going to build. And so 
Um, one application of this is in cancer biology, where when a cell uh, disconnects from the electrical network that tells that what kind of organ to be a part of, they basically revert to their ancient past. They become almost like amoebas, almost a unicellular existence. And so you can see here, even before this tumor is formed, already you can see this aberrant electrical signature of these cells here that are going to disconnect from that electrical network and basically uh, treat the rest of the body as just external environment. And in fact, if you then artificially force these cells into correct electrical patterning, then even though the oncogene right here is very strong, you can see it here, then there will be no tumor, okay? Because it's the electrical connection to the neighbors that makes the cells decide whether to go to metastasis or to build a normal organism. And beyond a single cell control like this, um, these bioelectric uh, cues have a very important role to play in uh, determining anatomy. So here you see this flatworm again. If uh, you take the middle fragment, okay, so away from the head and tail, you take this middle fragment. It has this, this really interesting voltage gradient that tells it how many heads it's supposed to have and where the head goes here. And if we manipulate those ion channels and change this electrical pattern, then you can make the cells build whatever you want. And so you can make them build another head. So you get these two-headed worms, or you can get no-headed worms. And the most amazing thing about uh, that is that this electrical circuit has memory. And once you make a two-headed worm, once you amputate, again, this middle fragment in plain water, no more manipulations of any kind, they continue to form two-headed animals. This change is per permanent. So the change to which these cells build after damage is specified by this electric circuit. It's rewritable, it's a kind of memory, and it is not genetic. There are no uh, transgenes here, there's no genomic editing, this is purely bioelectrical. And you can see here in this video what these uh, two-headed animals are like. Not only can you make extra heads, but in fact you can make heads belonging to other species. So in the same uh, triangular-headed uh, species, you can bioelectrically, by manipulating those electrical uh, conversations that these cells have, you can create flat heads, like a pifalina, round heads like an S. mediterranean, or the normal triangular heads. And in fact, their brain shape and the distribution of stem cells will be exactly like these other species. So again, you can shift the pattern to a species about 100 to 150 million years uh, evolutionary distance with no change of the genome. This is, this is the electrical pattern memory that tells these cells what to build. Now, we're, we, we're starting to use this to repair uh, defects, such as birth defects. So for example, here's a frog brain, here's the normal, uh, here's the normal brain like this. Uh, whether through mutation or exposure to alcohol or various other toxins, you could have these um, terrible brain defects where the forebrain is basically gone, the midbrain is a big bubble. And so what we did is to build a computer model of the electric circuit that tells the brain how big and what shape it should be during early embryogenesis. And you can ask these models, well, what channels would I manipulate using drugs, for example, ion channel drugs, um, to create the correct electrical pattern? And when you do that, you rescue the defect. So, so you get back a normal brain, normal structure, normal IQ, and so on. So this is the beginnings of using um, computer models to infer bioelectric interventions for regenerative medicine. So in the future, what we would like to do is to have a uh, computer system where you can actually design whatever structure you want. It might be an entirely different animal, it might be a human organ, whatever. And what the system will do is tell you what uh, stimuli, what signals need to be given to those cells to create whatever shape you want. It should be like computer-aided design. And th this is critical because if we understand what stimuli will convince this cellular collective to build specific shapes, we would have the solution then to um, almost all of the problems of medicine, so birth defects, um, injury, cancer, and aging, it could all be solved if we could control what it is that cells build. And I just want to show you one example of, of this. And so these are what we call xenobots. Um, they're little proto-organisms made of frog skin. So again, no brain, no nervous system, this is just frog skin. You can see it swimming along here. This is a uh, tracking data where many of them are interacting. And you can see here, some of them go in circles, some of them can patrol sort of back and forth. And um, this, is, this is one of them traversing a maze. So you can see here that it will, uh, this is still water, there's no water movement. So it will go take a corner. Uh, at this point, for some reason, it decides to turn around and go back where it came from. And so um, we have a new institute uh, with uh, Josh Bongard's lab at the University of Vermont, which is the Institute for Computationally Designed Organisms. And we want to broadly do two things. 
make uh, useful synthetic living machines for applications in the body, in the environment, for cleanup, rescue, exploration, and so on, and to use the system to unravel the basic mechanism of cell plasticity. Why and how do cells cooperate to build completely new things? These are made of frog skin, uh, no genetic editing. These are perfectly wild type frog genome. So um, I would just like to thank uh, the people who did the work. These are the postdocs and the students uh, who did the work that I showed you. Uh, Disclosure of Morphoceuticals Inc., which funds um, our work on limb regeneration. Um, and I thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it was really a very inspiring presentation, touching upon many of the, in, uh, I mean, of the, um, let's say, frontiers aspects of uh, of uh, um, synthetic biology, including uh, this idea of doing computation with living organisms. Uh, so this analogy between uh, living organisms and uh, machines or computers or codes. Uh, um, but at the same time, have you, as, as you have pointed out, it's not exactly like any other machine. It's not that you touch the DNA and you get the results. There are more complex processes like optimization, etc. And then maybe an anecdote that is curious for the people here uh, in Barcelona is that uh, a few years ago I wrote a story on Planaria and I found that um, many planar Planaria of the Mediterranean variant uh, that are being used in several, or at least were used at that time in several labs around the world, came from Montjuic, so from a place here <laughs> in Barcelona uh, where, they, where they live naturally. So they are spread all over the Mediterranean, but for historical reasons, many were taken out from here. Okay, so thanks a lot. So now uh, the floor is for Ron Weiss, the, our next speaker. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, okay, I switched to Catalan for the presentation. Com vaig comentar abans, és un dels pioners de la biologia sintètica, és professor del Departament d'Ingenieria Biològica del famós MIT i director del Centre de Biologia Sintètica de l'MIT porta investigant en aquest àmbit des de fa molt de temps, és uh, complicat, diguem-ne, donar un quadre de les diverses investigacions que ha fet. Podríem parlar de la síntesi de xarxes genètiques dissenyades eh, per generar càlculs lògics eh, i digitals in vivo, és a dir, utilitzar les xarxes genètiques per aquesta tasca que dèiem de computació, i també estudis a més gran escala, no tant a nivell, diguem-ne, d'ADN, amb agregats cel·lulars, eh, amb, amb el qual eh, les seves investigacions van fer tasques eh, coordinades eh, de, utilitzant una, bueno, una, un procés que es diu detecció del quòrum. Eh, I també, en general, ha reflexionat sobre els mètodes per millorar la nostra capacitat de dissenyar sistemes biològics. So, eh, Ron Weiss, the, the stage is yours. Okay. Great, let me share my screen. And can you see my screen okay? Now, yes. You can see it fine? Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I really wish uh, I was able to be there in person. Uh, I was really looking forward to this trip but I guess uh, hopefully there will be a next time. Uh, I, I love Barcelona and I love visiting there, so I get to do it on occasion and would love to come back there uh, soon. So I'll, I'll talk briefly about uh, some of our efforts with programmable organoids and they, they certainly relate to the discussion that uh, Mike just uh, presented and I'll focus on how we use mammalian synthetic biology to be able to program cells uh, for things like regenerative medicine and programmable organoids. And so we really need to always keep in mind, and I think uh, Mike pointed this out rather nicely, that biological complexity is, is quite intense. Uh, uh, so what I'm showing you here, for example, are two different uh, aspects of liver. So one of them on the left is liver development. This is a network that controls how livers develop. And on the right is a representation of liver metabolism. And the point is that what we'd like to do is actually create liver organoids in a petri dish and be able to use that for drug development. We'd like to be able to use that ultimately to actually transplant into people. And it's critical that we really appreciate and respect the underlying biological complexity, uh, how much we know, how much we don't know, but also the creation of sophisticated tools that allows to 
to deal with this biological complexity. So we really need a set of tools that allow us to address uh, what are called the five W's and two H's. This is one kind of simple way to think about it. Tools that allow us to address things like who are we going to be able to treat? Uh, when we think about, for example, generating a liver organ or liver organ organoid in a petri dish, what kinds of genes are we going to produce? When are we going to produce these genes? Where in the developing liver organoid are we going to produce these particular genes? Why might we want to do this? Well, we want to be able, for example, to help patients that have uh, a liver failure. So that's a high level. But on a technical level, we might say, why do we want to express this particular gene? Well, it might be because uh, there's an inherited metabolic uh, disorder that we want to fix, or that we want to help this liver organoid develop properly, uh, and it's the right time to express that particular gene. How are we going to express it? And it's also important to know how much. So there's a lot of really important technical questions that we need to be able to address uh, with the appropriate tools. And so for that, I've been interested in synthetic biology for quite some time, actually quite now about a quarter century since I was a graduate student. And I really got excited about the notion of thinking about cells as being programmable. So the notion that if we have a particular behavior in mind, we can specify a biological program that allows us to think about how to extend or modify the behavior of a cell using genetic mechanisms. So we'll take that high-level biological program, think about how to create a regulatory network, and then how to encode that regulatory network on a piece of DNA that we can then insert inside the genome of these cells so that we have a way of extending or modifying the behavior cells as if they were little computers. And so in order to do this, we often think about uh, partitioning these programs into three kinds of modules, okay? And this has essentially become the central dogma, if you will, in synthetic biology, where almost every system that, be, that is developed in synthetic biology has a sensory mechanism. So these would be genetically encoded sensors that can detect what's going on outside the cell, can detect what's going on inside the cell, and then they take that information and make decisions with logic processing. So I'm showing you here uh, a representation of a logic function, uh, and then a logic function, which is implemented within a biological system, is then able to regulate uh, therapeutic activity, for example, al alter how genes are expressed, secrete certain proteins, uh, control the metabolic activity of the cell. And so we can take this high-level representation of a logic function and begin to think about what kinds of uh, mechanisms can we build? Can we build a way to induce gene expression? Can we build memory? Can we be, build feedback regulation? And then once we figure that out, how do we encode a genetic regulatory network that actually accomplishes that function? And again, it's always important to remember that this genetic regulatory network really exists within a very complex biological environment that we only slightly understand. And so that really requires new kinds of methods and mechanisms to be able to program the cells effectively. And so one particular type of program that we're very interested in that I'll talk about uh, briefly uh, right now is this notion of creating genetic circuits that we embed into stem cells. Okay, so these could be different kinds of stem cells. And then this genetic circuit controls how the cells grow, proliferate, make all, all kinds of patterns, ultimately resulting in the formation of, for example, an or, uh, a desired organ, such as a liver organ. So the big question here, how do we actually create these genetic programs and embed them into the cells such that they control the spatial properties, the temporal properties, and uh, create gene expression that activates only in specific cell types? And so one of our goals, as I mentioned, is to be able to create an actual liver that recapitulates what a, what a liver looks like in a human. Uh, and then so we can do things like drug testing on it, so apply specific drugs and figure out how is this human liver in a petri dish reacting to these drugs so that we can improve drug development or how can we take these uh, liver organoids and actually be able to place them in somebody that has liver failures. And so what I'm showing you here is really the complexity at multiple scales of a liver organoid, the interactions, for example, 
uh, how hepatocytes within a liver organoid are arranged, uh, with a vasculature that is able to uh, provide blood to and have blood that gets detoxified, and then that gets routed, the toxins get routed to the biliary system. So it's really complex. And so the question is, how can we create something this complex uh, within kind of a non-natural environment that we can then put back into a human? And so for that, we've been uh, working on various steps to get us to the ultimate goal. Uh, so we've been able to, and this is now a, a little over 15 years ago, been able to demonstrate the ability to create a variety of different genetically encoded patterns. This was done in bacteria. And we said, now that we can create these patterns can, uh, in bacteria, can we begin to think about programming stem cells to be able to create these kinds of liver organoids? Uh, and we actually wanted to focus initially on the creation of uh, beta cells, which are important for uh, people that uh, have, for example, uh, insulin problems, so diabetics that have uh, issues so that their beta cells are not working fine. And we asked the question, can we take stem cells and create a multi-step biological program that can direct the differentiation of these stem cells uh, ultimately to uh, beta cells that we can then in, uh, embed into a diabetic. And so the notion was that we create a multi-step program that we would embed into the stem cells and then that would drive a multi-step differentiation program that essentially recapitulates biology and bio normal biological development. So it start with stem cells, go into endoderm, go into then once the cells realize that they become endoderm, go towards pancreatic progenitors, endocrine, and ultimately towards beta cells. This, uh, so I'm specifying the different steps in this biological program. And we ask the question, can we in fact build something that has this multi-step control capability? And so the first thing was to create the first step from stem cells into endoderm. And for that, Patrick Gee, a former postdoc in the lab, created the genetic circuit where we can put a small molecule in there and induce expression of a factor called GATA6, which was not known at the time, that actually drives the differentiation uh, of these cells towards uh, lineages. And so typically what we do in synthetic biology is we try to get very tight regulation of gene expression. But in this particular case, we actually ended up getting a very wide distribution of this factor, this GATA6 factor. And this tight distribution, even though it wasn't what we desired initially, ended up reason being the reason for the success. So this diversity in GATA6 expression levels resulted in the stem cells differentiating not just to endoderm, but also to mesoderm, and actually to ectoderm as well. And the reason that this was so important is that once we push the cells into endoderm and mesoderm, we asked the question, what will happen if we let them just continue to develop? And it turned out that the endoderm continued to develop towards various hepatic lineages, uh, including hepatocytes and cholangiocytes, which are really important for the liver formation, as well as the mesoderm developed into hematopoietic progenitors. So these would be things like blood cells, as well as an entire vasculature. So out of this system, we were able to create a liver organoid that actually contains all the cell types that are known to exist in an embryonic, in a fetal liver. So we really were excited about that. And this liver organoid really developed to a rather large entity that uh, after two and a half months was centimeters across. So it was very large. It had vasculature throughout. Uh, it had all the necessary cell types. And it also had good liver function, similar to adult function in terms of albumin production and urea synthesis, which are important elements of a liver operation. We asked the question, well, what about other li liver genes and functions? How well are those expressed and produced within the liver organoid? So we studied this in more detail. And just very briefly, what we saw is that most of the important liver genes were actually nicely expressed. So we compared this to adult liver and asked the question for 129 really important genes, you know, how well do we do with our liver organoid? So most of them did quite well, but about six to eight of them didn't really give us the levels that we needed. So we didn't have 
quote unquote, a perfect liver. And so we asked the question, can we use synthetic biology to be able to pinpoint and have precision fixing of this almost great liver, but not quite there. So for example, you know, we asked the question, there's a particular liver enzyme called CYP34 that didn't, and that's the one that's being shown right here, that wasn't quite right, didn't quite give us the levels that we want. And that's what I'm showing you all the way on the right side. So it didn't quite give us the levels that we'd like to see over the 37-day uh, experiment. So we asked the question, can we have pinpoint fixing of the problem such that when we have a hepatocyte develop that has great albumin urea synthesis, but not CYP384 synthesis, can we fix it? So can we create uh, a biological program so when the cells, some of the cells become hepatocytes, the genetic circuit detects that and fixes the problem by producing a lot more of this missing enzyme called CYP384. So we can sense it. We can sense that that particular cell has been reached. And it's important that we have a sensor that only activates in hepatocytes and does not activate in the rest of this developing liver organoid. Because if it, that gene gets expressed in other cells, it could really disrupt the situation. So we have to have pinpoint accuracy with this genetic circuit. And indeed, we're able to develop a genetic circuit. And just for the sake of time, I won't get into the details of that. A genetic circuit that can detect the presence of a biomarker called microRNA, specifically microRNA-122. When that microRNA-122 goes high, that is indicative of that cell being a hepatocyte. And then we activate expression of the necessary gene that wasn't quite at the right levels. And so what I'm showing you here is a situation where if the microRNA-122 is low, nothing is happening. But when the microRNA-122 is high, then we activate uh, the, uh, the expression of the CYP384 conditioning only within those cell types. We also express uh, a red fluorescent protein. And indeed, uh, urea albumin remain nice, nicely high, but the CYP384 levels go up by a factor of 100. So we're able to fix this problem of this uh, non-perfect liver organoid, and we can create something that actually is much more like an adult liver organoid. And we can use this technology to basically address many other issues. We can build more sophisticated logic. So for the sake of time, I won't get into that. So if we want more sophisticated detection sensing capabilities, we can do that. Um, and we've been able to actually uh, demonstrate this sophisticated multi-input capabilities, not just for liver organoids, but also being able to create sensors that activate only in uh, cancer cell types, but not in healthy cells. I'm showing you um, some data over here that we can activate this and we can create really rather sophisticated multi-input genetic circuit mechanisms that uh, in this particular case, detect the difference between cancer and non-cancer cells and actually kill the cancer cells and leave the healthy cells alone. So our goal with programmable organoids is to be able to have this precise control over development, uh, be able to sense what's going on there, and ultimately actually create these organs that can sense uh, aberrant uh, conditions in the body and actually express genes that can fix certain problems. For example, if you have um, some kind of a metabolic disorder uh, or you have elevated enzymes or uh, so on, we'd be able to have a sense and respond organoid that can very quickly detect uh, these types of conditions. Lots of people in my lab to thank for this. And I wanna thank you for your uh, attention as well. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, it's really impressive how you started with this abstract concept of uh, programming uh, um, gene networks and then you arrive to something that you can see on, really on a, on a plate. So now we move to our third speaker, Nuria Monserrat. She's, uh, okay, switch to Catalan once again. Nuria Monserrat, Professora de Recerca y Crea de l'Institut de Bioengenyeria de, de Catalunya, eh, ha treballat eh, un dels seus resultats principals és l'ús de cèl·lules mares per generar microòrgans humans al laboratori i eh, aquest, eh, aquest coneixement elaborat amb aquesta investigació ha tingut una aplicació a més a més eh, molt recentment en eh, l'investigació 
del Covid-19. Hem donat un petit privilegi, diguem, als nostres ponents de fora de fer una presentació més llarga en PowerPoint per compensar que no estaven aquí i ara li dono la paraula a la Núria que farà una presentació sense PowerPoint, diguem. Thank you, thank you very much, Michele, and good morning for you, Michael and Ron. It's a pleasure for me to be here discussing with you in this hybrid way of doing things in this biennial, which is great. I can bring a presentation, so I will be brief and, and maybe recover some of, of, thing, of the things that you have been both discussing. But I think it's important to, to recall that uh, contrary to other systems or other organisms like newts or insects, human cannot regenerate their organs. So in the last five decades, uh, it's been um, observed and also reported by many laboratories around the world, uh, fortunately, that we can use a specific cell types like stem cells to generate small pieces of tissues or nowadays uh, three-dimensional structures that recall the, the human organs. And these small uh, three-dimensional cultures are called organoids. Uh, one example is the fantastic work from uh, Ron Weiss, working in liver organoids. And in the lab, we are very focused on understanding how, for example, a kidney, a mammalian kidney, is formed during development. And for that, we use normally um, systems that can help you to understand how a tissue and an organ grows in the lab. But most importantly, when thinking about all these things that, um, as you say at the beginning, uh, look like uh, future science, it's important always to remember that all these questions have been posed uh, almost in the last two centuries when developing uh, developmental biology is starting to address on the question on how a tissue develops, how an embryo is formed, and, and we can find already uh, incredible um, books and, and textbooks from, from uh, the beginning of last century when people were addressing on the question of how, how, for example, sponges were formed, how these structures were rebuilt in nature. And from that knowledge, nowadays, we are doing part of this fantastic work like uh, growing these mini organs. We are going back to those works and putting these asteroids in cultural systems that were already described by zoologists at the beginning of, of last century. And I will just briefly comment maybe on, on the reuse and rethink about all these technologies content, constantly, at least for us, uh, although we work with bioengineering and we are taking applications uh, forehand like CRISPR-Cas9 technology, but we always have uh, still many questions. So how are we going to really um, direct a specific differentiation from, those, from these human pluripotent stem cells to develop into something that we aim to produce in the petri dish. And as Ron Weiss was telling us, synthetic biology uh, is, a, is a key tool for addressing on this question. But still from the field of bioengineering, we need to understand how to build up technology to construct all these constraints and also to have measures to uh, understand uh, the extent of the differentiation or of the function of this specific organoid. And you were putting the example of using organoids, for example, to target um, first, first steps of infection of mm. SARS-CoV-2. This part of the work was done in my lab, but fortunately in collaboration with many other researchers all over the world. And I think that now these technologies are really key uh, to at least try to put questions that before uh, were relying in the use of animal systems. You were needing to take a long step even years to address these questions that now we can uh, go into the lab, build uh, an organoid system which won't be perfect, because if we compare with the native tissue or with the adult tissue, we have, a sti we have a still a lot of challenges to overcome. And in this, we believe that bioengineering is key to help us to grow these organoid systems. But in the example of the pandemics, for example, organoids have been really key for starting to address on the question on how SARS-CoV-2 infects tissues in humans, but also even to identify compounds that can block the first steps of infection. So it's a pity I cannot show pictures. People of my lab is in the audience. I would also like to thank them very much. And, and, and thanks to you for, for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Nuria. Uh, and I think this example of uh, SARS, uh, um, of, of uh, the cor coronavirus uh, uh, infection is um, especially remarkable because it shows that something that may look like, you know, very futuristic and, you know, very ambition, ambitious, like creating an organoid, something that is akin to a human organ built 
from scratch in a lab, uh, it's already yielding fruits, okay? It's already a model that can be used to do uh, really um, research that can have important applications in a problem like the one we have been facing, unfortunately, in the last uh, few months, let's say. Okay, so I will keep my um, moderation short in order to have time for you to think about questions, so start to think about them. Um, maybe the first question I have is that um, the language that the three of you have been using, which is the, a language of engineering or of uh, computer science, like, you know, programming organs, um, engineering organs, etc., is usually referred to things that are machines or our computers or our computer codes. So I would like to ask you in um, a very, let's say, broad questions that any of you can answer or, or the three or whoever wants, which is how similar is living tissues, living organisms to these things that we are saying that is computer codes and machines and what are the key differences from based on your respective research? Whoever wants to answer can kick in and just start. I guess I will. Uh, I'll, I'll say that uh, the, the nice thing about computer science is that it is not about computers as we know it. So computer science has nothing to do with the kinds of devices that we see today as computers. It's an abstraction that helps us to understand and manipulate complex systems that have the imp important um, property that they're reprogrammable. Okay, and so any system that uh, where, where you can um, rationally make use of signals or stimuli, not just rewiring, not just physical change, but actually uh, uh, stimuli and signals to alter what the way that system is going to program, um, uh, process information, that is an appropriate uh, thing on which to use tools of computer science. So the tools of computer science are extremely um, general. They're very applicable to the kinds of things living things do. And it is not because living things are like today's computers. It's because we can use some of those insights. You know, look, look at what look at the journey that computer science took from physically having to rewire computers to program them in the 50s. Right. You can see pictures of you know people pulling wires back and forth, whereas now we can think about um, asking them to do very complex things without worrying about the hardware at all, right? There's, there's this distinction between hardware and software. And that I think is a very powerful notion and it's it's true in biology and it's not just for what we recognize as computers. Yeah, yeah and maybe I can build on that. I, I you know, completely agree with Mike. Uh, the nice thing is that we now have the ability to really uh, you know, genetically reprogram cells. So we have the ability to modify kind of the, the underlying code that runs biological systems. And, and there is an underlying code uh, and it appears magic to us, but, but it, does, it is based on physics. It is based on biochemistry. The problem is that it's incredibly complex and that we only barely understand it. And there's, you know, we understand certain principles, but we don't understand many of the details. We don't fully understand how uh, biology is able to uh, get organization out of uh, many parts that are really not robust, unreliable, uh, uh, very have very limited resources. So I think that kind of the great challenge for us now is to not just be able to apply uh, principles that we have been using in computer science to program computers or principles that we've been using uh, to engineer cars and planes and robots, but really try to understand what are the uh, biological principles that we can use to program uh, biology effectively? And it's not going to be the same. It's not going to look like, you know, Python code that you write uh, for programming uh, a web server, right? And it's not going to look exactly like three-dimensional design tools that you use to program a plane, but it's going to have to be something that digs deeper and understands what the trade-offs is Understand, understand how to create reliable behavior um, in unreliable systems. And we, and we need, you know, what's really gonna be exciting is to be able to come up with these abstractions that work well. And for example, they use notions in biology such as emergence, right? So what are the building program build, programming building blocks that are gonna be allowing us to use emergence as an abstraction to create uh, reliable multicellular biological systems? 
Yeah, I would like also to add uh, on, on the fact that the use of, for example, stem cells, that they do self-organize uh, and we can uh, understand some processes that are important, as I mentioned before, about how an organ forms in the petri dish. We are still missing ways to uh, understand these principles that Ron was telling, right? So we know that the self-organization principle organizes the system, then the cells start to differentiate, Externally, we provide several inputs into the system, and then we are starting now to understand some of the outputs, at least with pluripotent stem cells, for some specific questions that we have. So we are still in the surface of this, but uh, the combination of all these tools will be key for the next years to address on these complex questions, as Roman was telling. Yeah, yeah. So. Thanks. And um, then, I, I mean, I would like to, let's say, bring these down to earth, let's say, as much as possible in terms of its potential or current applications, okay? So, of course, I mean, if you are thinking of programming or engineering living systems, an obvious thing that would come to my mind is the next thing is like robots, no? Of like using robots or computers that are made out of biological material. But I can imagine that this research may have some application also to these big environmental, like, challenges like climate and biodiversity challenges that we are facing, and of course health. So could you, could you give me a more, I mean, you have already given a bunch of ideas, especially related to the health, potential health application, but could you give me some ideas of what is the breadth of uh, potential applications of this research, including health and beyond health? Yeah. So I, mean, I guess I can sign up to uh, Mike will have lots and lots of other ideas. I mean, but with respect to being, you know, you mentioned the, the notion of biobots. I mean, and, and Mike, le Mike showed some really cool biobots. Imagine being able to program them to move around, you know, detect toxins in the environment, be able to clean up the toxins, be able to communicate that information back to kind of the, the master ship or, or whatever it is. So environmental remediation is absolutely um, an, an exciting opportunity. I think the notion of um, also construction, so we talked about organoids, but bioconstruction in the sense that can we uh, program biological systems to uh, create structures in situations where it might be difficult. So, you know, this notion of a tree house, right? So maybe we can actually program uh, uh, cells, like plant cells to actually create structures that we can live in. And these and uh, structures that we, that would actually be regenerative and able to, um, you know, fix when there's all cracks in, in the, you know, in the walls or something like that. So be able to, to adjust, you know, to the climate conditions as well. So, I mean, there's just some fantastic, uh, fun ideas out there. And, you know, maybe Mike and Maria can uh, continue, you know, continue on that as well. My, my, sorry, my ideas were not so great and cool. Uh, I was more thinking about some examples that happened recently, more related with, with the use, for example, of particles that can you can coat and you can decorate with materials that can sense, that can move around. You can use those for cleaning. And there is a, a huge a huge now necessity to, to work, for example, in blue health. So in the reconstruction of the marine uh, ecosystem, but also in, an, in, an, in a circular manner, right? So now we are starting to see different projects in where people is really doing fascinating work, modifying bacteria, or also building up uh, nanobots, in this case, based on nanoengineering, so with nanomaterials to clean surfaces and also to sense until which extent also that surface is contaminated. So this is something that is already ongoing. Very yeah, yeah, so this is really, really Michael, good. do you want to add anything on this point? Sure. Um, yeah, so so the, these are all great examples. I mean, the, the bots that that we've been making, uh, one could easily imagine them interacting with other cells, either in the body, so chasing down cancer cells, sculpting arthritic knee joints, um, repairing uh, a, a breaks, let's say, nervous system uh, uh, defects and, you know, laying down pro-regenerative kinds of molecules. Uh, also in the environment, right, for sensing and, and, and cleanup or, or microfabrication, um, bioengineered organs that need to be sculpted at a scale that, that is very hard to do either either by hand or, or by traditional robotics. 
uh, lots of lots and lots of applications. And the, the trick to all of this, you know, what I think the rate limiting step to all of this is going to be to really get better at first of all programming the individual cells, which is what the other two speakers have been have been talking about. These really um, critical techniques to reprogram the activity of the individual cells, but also to learn to reprogram the collective. Okay, so there's a there's there are, there are multiple levels here. There there are the individual cells, but there's also a a collective a morphogenesis of the of the tissue and the or the organ, and that has its own. There are there are techniques for for programming the activity of that, and so those two things together are going to be an, an incredibly powerful tool for all the applications that you, that we've talked about. Yeah, and my last question before opening to the floor is related. I mean, we, we are talking about you know engineering life and uh, really interacting with some very basic mechanisms of uh, yeah of life of biological systems, and so of course this. I, it raises a lot of questions in terms of the ethical limits, whether that this can, may, can have some sort of uh, impact on our um, organism, the human organism, and also on environment. Uh, imagine, you know, spreading around these nanobots, these, sorry, biobots. Uh, by the way, I think it's pretty exciting, something you can tell home when you go back, that you have seen a bio-boat moving there in the screen this afternoon. <laughs> it's really something uh, uncommon, let's say. You, you don't see it every day. But anyway, OK, going back to my question, um, what are your thoughts about the ethical challenges that are raised by this research, whether there is anything th that the community, maybe the scientific community, should do anything similar to what, for example, has been done on regarding CRISPR-Cas9 in terms of saying, OK, we don't touch. Uh, mm, embryos or we don't make them make, uh, sorry, human embryos uh, with CRISPR-Cas9 unless they are not viable, etc. Any important input that you think will be important in the future on the ethical side? From my well, side, I think that the ethical discussion, it's been already from a long time. So it's been a lot of people like Roger Kahn at MIT and many others that already are talking about ethic bioengineering. So we need to also rebuild the concept of ethics we have, considering that many of these technologies are quite new. So we need to have a constant dialogue about what for that experiment, what for that particular um, um, yeah, question, uh, and what will you get into return. So from the uh, M-Cells community, or the, the community working, working already in these issues, there is a lot of debate. And, and I think that we are all in a, in, a, in a good momentum because we are interacting with many bioethicists from the field, for example, of pluripotent stem cells or for discussing openly uh, the extent of, of how much organoids can be mani manipulated, until which extent you can extend the culture, uh, until which extent you can mix cells of different animal origins, mm. and, but most importantly, what for? So what will that experiment tell you? So I think that this concept of uh, bioengineering ethics also indicates that th there is a necessity, but also that there is a, a constant dialogue among these two disciplines. And, and from the start, I think that we have been in a very good position for addressing these kind of questions. But it's true that we need always to, to make the correct question. And maybe from the scientific uh, aspect, we are forgetting important things. So to work together with bioethicists, for sure, and philosophers, this helps a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, I completely agree. Uh, this, this has been going on for quite some time, uh, discussions about uh, the ethics of all of this. And, and I, I just want to bring a, um, another perspective that sometimes gets lost here, which is that in addition to the concerns about the dangers of, of various of this technology and uh, the different ethical responsibilities that we have to different kinds of tissues and so on. I think it's really critical to keep in mind the moral imperative to do this work because there are the, the, there are incredible um, needs both in in uh, the biomedical aspects, uh, in the environmental aspects. You know, there there are people who who, who call my lab weekly with with different uh, you know sort of t t t all kinds of terrible disorders and things and. It's really critical to know that we don't just assume that everything now is great and that we better not do anything that would be, you know, dangerous or, or you know, unacceptable. We actually th things are not great for a lot of people, right? There are there are massive disparities in health, in, in environmental access, and so on. 
And there is, a, there is an absolute moral imperative to drive the science forward to the point where we can relieve some of the suffering and we can actually make life better. I think that's really important that we not only look at the negative, you know, what can't we do, what shouldn't we do, but actually we have to look at what do we have to do? What are we morally obligated to do to bring the science to the point where we can actually help people? I think that's really important. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, again, I agree with uh, Nuria and Mike. Um, and we have, as, as Nuria mentioned, we've, we've been in synthetic biology now for two decades. We've been communicating with bioethicists. And I think uh, it is important to essentially uh, treat um, bioethics as a first class citizen and not just something that we kind of do on the side and, and do after the fact. And, and uh, we actually, in my lab, I've had bioethicists embedded in the lab and actually even written books about kind of the interaction that we've that had with the scientists. And so I think this, you know, uh, in-person interactions, hopefully after COVID, you know, would really elicit much better understanding on both sides. And we've also had, uh, Nuria mentioned this, um, Roger Kahn, we, we have this uh, Science and Technology Center that where we held uh, yearly ethics modules where all the scientists really got to ask uh, questions and were asked important questions about bioethics. So I do, I do think, as Mike mentioned, that there's, there's currently an, an imperative to be able to address uh, both health, health and environmental issues. And I think some of it, I would say, quote unquote, is easy in the sense that, you know, if we're fixing somebody's failed liver, then I would say there's not a great moral dilemma there. We should, you know, we should be able to help the individual uh, as quickly as, as as we can and as as well as we can. Uh, I do think that as we move forward, and that's, you know, if we're looking, you know, 10, 20 years down the road, when we begin to think about enhanced function. So imagine somebody has a failed liver, then we begin to think about, well, we can substitute that liver for a super liver that now has enhanced, you know, metabolic capabilities. Maybe, you know, it's able to process beer a lot better, or, you know, something like that. Uh, and so, so then I think it becomes not trivial, non-trivial to think about it. And so once we get to the situation where there's enhanced function, uh, I could see arguments both ways in terms of like, is this something that uh, should be done or is this something that shouldn't be done? And I, and I think that they, the, the conversation has to, be, has to happen between scientists and the public. And there's also a situation where um, the attitudes and what is accepted is not static but it's actually going to be dynamic and it's going to evolve over time so as people realize the benefits of various uh things that technology can provide it is very possible that their attitudes would, will change about it i mean i think you know and a simple example is vaccination right where a lot of, there's a lot of vaccination hesitancy uh but as we gain, gain experience and learn, oh, it's, it's safe, you know, it, it is a gain of function, right? We now have the ability to fight infections in ways that we weren't able to do that before. And society fully now, I mean, many people in society now uh, fully accept the notion that they'll get DNA or RNA inside their body to genetically reprogram them. Yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. And, that, that, and that's a complete transformation in society. Uh, that's happening now, and, and I think will com continue to happen as well. Yeah, absolutely. The experience of the pandemics has been a laboratory for the, all these uh, ethical issues. Uh, and I mean, and it's very interesting to hear that this research is bringing in from the beginning all these uh, uh, ethical um, thoughts, which is an important lesson from things that have, ha have happened in the past in which, you know, science and ethics have sometimes worked separately for too much time. So since we, the Biennale allows us to extend a little bit, maybe mm, ten to five to ten minutes more, uh, I would like to open to the floor. You have the opportunity to ask two <laughs> very important researchers in the field any curiosity, question, fantasy, science fiction scenario, or whatever. Okay, so one person there. Just a second, the mic is not working, so once.
Okay, so we have a technical blip, but it will be fixed soon. So an opportunity for other people to think about any thoughts or questions they may have. Me personally, I have many, but I will refrain because <laughs> otherwise we will be here up to this night, up to tonight. Okay. Sí, mi pregunta es eh, sobre el tema de las patentes, eh, porque especialmente cuando afectan a formas vivas o contienen partes que son ADN de formas vivas, ¿qué sucede cuando estamos patentando co cosas que ya están en la naturaleza o fragmentos de ADN que puede ser humano, animal, planta o incluso una forma de vida nueva que, que ha sido programada? ¿no? O sea, ¿qué, ¿Qué opináis o cuál es vuestra perspectiva acerca de las patentes dentro de este tipo de tecnología, de la biotecnología. ¿Tienen traducción? ¿Tienen traducción? Sí, sí. Okay. You are hearing the translation, right? Or do you want me to translate for you? No, no. No, okay. I'm, I'm sorry. So I'm, okay. I'm so to not answer that one. No, okay. But uh, I, I will quickly translate it for you. So the question was about patents in biotechnology. What do you think about it? What are the aspects to be taken into account when patenting, uh, mm, I think I'm translating correctly, when patently a tissue or a piece of a tissue or cells or whatever. Any thought on this more commercial aspect? Which is in fact sometimes the source of many conflicts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I can tell, I, I'm not going to have a great answer to that because I, I actually uh, can see both sides. I, I do think, so one thing, I, I do think during the pandemic, I'm definitely in favor of, uh, you know, uh, what was it? Uh, removing the patents on the vaccination, because I think that's a that's that's a situation that is so dramatic. We're talking about so many lives around the world that are being affected by it, uh, and and the fact that if we somehow relax the patents and allow other companies to uh, manufacture these vaccines. Uh, it, it would be of tremendous value to the world. So, so in this particular uh, situation, I, I would be in favor of taking fairly dramatic action and voiding certain patents, as long as we understand that, that the voiding of certain patents will allow uh, manufacturing to actually happen much more efficiently. Because, uh, in, for example, for the messenger RNA uh, by you know Moderna and Pfizer, it's not clear where the bottleneck is so it might actually be you know kind of an upstream bottleneck in terms of availability you know of of the uh ingredients that are necessary to make rna so it's actually not clear in that case that avoiding the patents would help i mean i do think that on the other hand that there is a role for patents i mean we uh patents are uh a mechanism to encourage uh creativity it's a mechanism to encourage investment in risky processes. And, uh, you know, uh, many uh, of the really exciting drugs that are available uh, would not be possible without uh, investors betting on many different kinds of failed efforts. So for every, fa uh, you know, success that we see, and we see, oh my God, you know, they're making so much money on this. There's, you know, at least nine other cases of huge investments of tens of millions, hundreds of millions of billions of dollars sometimes that, that completely fail. So even though, you know, you know, it's almost like a necessary evil no, no, no. in a sense right now to be able to, uh, you know, create a mechan effective mechanism uh, to drive forward uh, certain kinds of innovation. Okay, so if anybody wants to kick in, otherwise maybe next question if there's one. Okay, one here from Ricard. Hi, since we are allowed to go into the science fiction, um, <laughs> uh, there's one topic that we have been discussing uh, actually with Nuria over the last year about the limits of what can be engineered. And um, you all are thinking in uh, engineering uh, liver organoids or kidney organoids, brain organoids. What about or, uh, organs and organoids that do not exist? So 
Uh, what do you think about that? Would it be possible to uh, actually invent a new kind of organ or organoid with a new name because it gives different functions? Yeah, I, I, I think absolutely. So uh, we, we are now, you know, human bioengineers are now a kind of facilitator of exploring new uh, corners of the option space of possible creatures. And this is not only new organs, but uh, entirely new organisms uh, of, of novel uh, bodies and uh, cognitive structures that we've never seen before. This is, this is the beginning of a really important um, expansion of uh, work that up until now has been focused on model species. So, you know, we've worked at zebrafish and Drosophila and mouse and human, and, but now this is just, you know, this is just an incredibly small part of the space of all possible agents, both, both physically and uh, cognitively. And uh, this, this will open up some very interesting work in the future. It goes way beyond just novel organs. Yeah. Great. Thanks a lot. So since we are over time, uh, I would like to thank once again uh, Michael Levin, Ron Weiss, and uh, Nuria Munserrat. I also would like to thank Nuria and Ricard for inviting me and, and giving me the opportunity to moderate this debate and the whole event, which is really, I mean, it's amazing that amid uh, a pandemic we are meeting here and, uh, and uh, discussing broadly, uh, extensively about real science. It's really something that I, mean, I would like to congratulate, congratulate you for this uh, amazing program. And so thanks a lot. Thanks for, for, to you for being here and for your questions and your thoughts. And OK, bye bye. See you soon. <laughs> Thank you. you so much. See you. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.